Hi, everyone. It's Shannon. We're always looking for ways to support the podcast. And one way that you can do that is through our store. If you go to shop.brucely.com and look for podcast bundle on the nav bar, any item you see there is 15% off. And if you buy the entire bundle, then it's 20% off. And a portion of all proceeds on no matter what you buy, go to support the Bruce Lee Foundation. And you can also just donate directly to the Bruce Lee Foundation through the store as well. So that's shop.brucely.com. Look for the podcast bundle. And thank you so much for supporting the Bruce Lee Podcast. Thanks, everyone. Now entering Nerdist.com. Empty your mind. Be formal. Shape it. Like water. Now water comes from no. Welcome to the Bruce Lee Podcast, a podcast about Bruce Lee's life and philosophy. Hi, everyone. This is Shannon Lee. And this is Sharon Lee. And welcome to the Bruce Lee Podcast. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. So the Bruce Lee Podcast is an applied philosophy podcast where we break down my father's philosophies and tell you how to... Use them in your daily lives toward more inspiration and motivation. And occasionally we have special guests. Like today. Like today. <laughs> <laughs> so in studio we have our um, semi-regular visit from our most favorite guest, Linda Lee Cadwell, a.k.a. my mom. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <laughs> So we just thought that we would spend some time because, you know, it's always good to go straight to the source, mm -hmm. get the information firsthand, you know, just sort of talk story around my dad and times and what was going on. And we actually picked a couple of topics we thought might be interesting to discuss. But of course, the conversation will go where it goes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so thanks, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Always fun to talk to people about Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Especially us, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> We're the number one fans. <laughs> well, this is how you've gotten to know your dad so well over all these years. Yeah. Because you were ways. only four years old when he passed away. Yeah. So the influence of friends and family mm -hmm. over all these years have gotten you to know him. Yeah. And then also through his own words. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah, because it's so intimate. Like reading Bruce's words and his diary entries, it's really has, I mean, I feel like I know him intimately, you know, and it's like, that's such a gift that mm -hmm, he left mm -hmm. us. It is. And that he was so honest and so vulnerable and so open. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's like, it makes me feel like, oh, I, I should probably write more stuff down for my kids when I'm not <laughs> yeah. he, he was uh, very prolific in writing mm -hmm. and writing down his feelings mm -hmm. as well and his thoughts and his directions. And it's never good to lie to people, but especially important not to lie to yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he, he was not like that. He wrote down his feelings and what he wanted to do and mm -hmm. where he thought he could do better in some areas and he, he wrote it all down. Mm. And I think the thing that's also nice is because he, he seemed to sort of mull things over and do multiple drafts, like even mm -hmm. of letters that he wrote to other people, like we happen to mm -hmm. have those mm -hmm. because he would do drafts and he would make changes yeah. and corrections and for sure. Yeah, for sure. It's very interesting to read his drafts and where he crossed out mm -hmm. and replaced it. And so he just was always thinking about that. And that's the way he thought about his um, scripts that he wrote and maybe making changes to the scripts mm -hmm. and producing the product that we see today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've kind of lost all that because of the computer and we just do edits and then all the old <gasps> versions just go away. Mm -hmm. I know. And so what we don't get to see is the progress of the thinking yeah. and the progress of the awareness that comes up mm -hmm. when you are writing. Yeah, That's so true. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's lucky. We didn't have them back then and yeah. at his time. I don't think he would have liked it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I keep a journal, a handwritten journal. Mm -hmm. And um, and sometimes I think like, oh, maybe I should just do this on the computer because I can type so much faster than I can write. Mm -hmm. But then, I don't know, sometimes there's something sort of inorganic about like having your fingers hovering over the keyboard sometimes for me, mm -hmm. if it's very personal or I'm working something out, you know, so I like to just write it down. Yeah, that, well, I think that's a good practice. On the another take on that is that I have written stuff down in the past, and then dragged it out twenty years later and looked at it and go, "Oh my goodness, I don't think I feel that way anymore." <laughs> or what was I thinking? Or... <laughs> well, I think in particular when you start sort of, a, especially if you're young, when you start a process of journaling, a lot of it is just complaining. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, like yeah. I go back to my journals from when I was like in my teens and twenties and I'm just like, Wow <laughs> <laughs> talking about like this person is so annoying and blah blah blah. You know, it's like well, why am I recording this? Yeah. It, <laughs> what helps, is the it point? helps you to get to know your daughter better. <laughs> Because there she is at yeah. that stage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I well, it also, like, it helps you expel that, right? Yeah. And just totally. get yes, it, it out does. of your body. And yeah. so then, you know, yeah. you're kind of processing it yourself. Yeah. There is more than one reason to journal. And one mm -hmm. of them is literally just to, like, get it out mm -hmm. get of your it system. Out on the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not continually on a nonstop record in yeah. your head. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, I find that the things we tend to to write a lot of times, and this is what I think is so interesting about dad's writings, is that so many of those writings where you are just sort of like getting it out, they're so negative. You know, like, God, I feel like such an idiot for having done this, or I'm feeling really upset today, or da da da. Mm -hmm. And his writings are not that yeah, way. Not at all. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, very much so. Because he was so disciplined yeah. about keeping that positivity, right? Right. Even in his innermost thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, that's true. Because, uh, yeah, when you have a negative thought, people, other philosophers or psychologists will tell you, oh, just change it mm -hmm. to a positive thought, mm -hmm. you know, just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But that's not that easy to do. No. No. <laughs> And so writing it down does help to purge it. But on the other hand, what you said about Bruce was he was very positive because he was always moving forward. He wasn't looking back. And... Well, and also I think sometimes writing down negative thoughts helps to concretize negativity, <laughs> which is not a good idea. Yeah, not or what just you want. reinforces it. Yeah. 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 And so I think for him, because he had such, you know, he was always saying like, keep your mind on the things you want and off the things you yes. don't and plant flowers, not weeds and all that stuff. It's like, you know, he had a very diligent practice mm -hmm. of just putting down what he wanted and what he was going for. That's true. And he was constantly reading uh, books that were geared towards positive thinking. Mm -hmm. And so... If he did get into a rut, you know, he could always pull himself out by referring to a certain book or a certain philosopher. Yeah, and it's not to say the negative thoughts aren't there. I mean, everybody I mean, has them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just an interesting to see that he wrote so much, and yet most of it, almost all of it, is in this kind of positive upliftment kind mm. of you yeah. know, category, and it's unusual if you're looking yeah. at kind of anybody's journals in general. <laughs> yeah. Don't read mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday someone will be reading them. I know. Yeah. I have to burn Doing them the all podcast. before that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, but in fact, one of the things that we thought might be interesting to talk about in a little bit more detail, because we've mentioned it and talked about it several times on the podcast, was that moment when he injured his back really mm. severely, you know, yeah. and, and we all know, you know, sort of the general story, which was that he was warming up and or didn't warm up and went straight into this really rigorous exercise and damaged his sacral nerve and mm -hmm. was laid up for a long time and, and wrote the walk on on the card and, mm -hmm. and got himself back in health. But I mean, having you here as the person who lived through it, like, mm -hmm. we just thought it would be interesting because that is a moment, I think, you know, when he's laid low, which yes. I would imagine was extremely difficult for him. 
<laughs> yes, it was. Yes. And you. To put it mildly. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, it was a very difficult time. And if there was really a low moment in his lifetime, that would be it. Mm -hmm. When he was so discouraged and people were telling him, doctors were telling him, you know, that he had great reason to be discouraged because he was never going to be normal again. Mm -hmm. Normal as in walking, mm -hmm. not to speak of even doing Kung Fu and doing kicks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He was not going to be able to do that. So when the experts are telling you that, that's just a very, very low time. So, and it was for him, but he, uh, did have to go through that because he did have to lay low. He did have to take care of his back and allow it to heal. Mm -hmm. um, but he just started figuring it out for himself in addition to taking the doctor's advice and all that stuff. But he would get books on kinesiology, physical yeah. therapy. I do and, think it's interesting, like, if you go through the books in the library that we have, there are a number of books on how to cure back pain, yeah. you know, what to do, you know, musculature yeah. and nerves and, yes. and biomechanics and, yeah. you know, like, all these crazy, like, 1960s titled books about, like, you know, what to do with your back and they have all these crazy titles <laughs> yeah. but let's back up for a minute and let's talk about like were you home on the day that this happened were you there? yes but I, I was there yes but I have to tell you that at the moment that it happened it wasn't like critical it mm -hmm. wasn't like he fell down on the floor or in, in pain or anything like that it was mm -hmm. just a Oh, that doesn't feel too good, you know. And then it was uh, came on more gradually after that. So mm -hmm. at first it wasn't like, oh, this is going to be the end of your career mm -hmm. right here, right now. Right. Not speeding off to the hospital or something. Right. So it just, the pain just increased and increased and increased until he, you know, sought some help with it and x-rays and, mm -hmm. and everything. So... So I'd imagine that he continued to exercise and mm -hmm. teach and do all that with this problem. For a short time For there. A short time. I mean, he did go to the doctor to see what was the problem. And then, you know, we had our, our family doctor and he sent him to a orthopedic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it was then became a process, you know, mm -hmm. of what's wrong and then what should we do with it? And do you consider surgery and all that kind yeah. of thing, you know, and... And, and was I, that the recommendation? It was a suggestion mm -hmm. that this could be, you know, you know, back pain is something that's not easily solved. Yeah, it's, and there's many yeah. options often, mm -hmm. you know. And back surgery, even I think today, is not a popular choice by mm -hmm. people. Yeah, because especially not is, 1960s back surgery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it has, you know, consequences. Mm -hmm. And so surgery was to be avoided mm -hmm. and so the the prescription was rest mm. hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah yes hey and, person who can't hold still for two yeah. seconds <laughs> <laughs> yes and uh -huh. that that became very difficult for him however the thing is that he just switched gears mm -hmm. you know he said well this is the time of my life then that i'm going to do what i've said i want to do and i'm going to start taking notes and reading and applying the things that I learned to my life, to my martial arts, to mm. my philosophy. Mm. And thus we have those volumes of writings that mm. he did during that time. Yeah. The commentaries on the martial way. Commentaries on the martial way. So he was productive, not to say it wasn't a downtime. It yeah, was. No, of course. Yeah. What was the nature of the pain? I mean, was it like, I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, I've thrown my back out. You've thrown your back out, right? Like yeah. everybody's, all, everybody of a certain age has done that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all had that experience of like, ooh, that doesn't feel good yeah. or right, yeah. right? And then we just yeah. kind of keep and you like going kind on. of hobbling, like you, it's hard yeah. to stand, it's hard to sit, it it's just hard to move. Yes, and it was for him. Mm -hmm. um, he laid out a program for himself mm -hmm. in the, from his readings, and he's, you know, because they told him, don't even walk. 
mm-hmm. at first. Right. So he did not at first. And was I'm he gonna... using like ice and heat and all oh, that yeah. business? Oh, like... sure. All the mm-hmm. usual prescription and painkillers. Mm-hmm. But he would he could get up and walk to the bathroom or something like that, you know. Right. But basically, he stayed flat on his back with those treatments, ice, heat, painkillers, and all of that. Mm-hmm. But um, so then he followed a step by step program from his readings, you know, gr- very gradually. First walking a little bit, and then you know a little faster, getting on his bike. Bike is great therapy, mm-hmm. and. So when he was writing, you know, working on the commentaries and all that, like, was he laying down? Yeah, doing he was that? mostly laying down. Yeah, wow. yeah, that's kind of hard to write. Hard laying to do. Down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and wow. and calling for service. <laughs> <laughs> that would be you. Linda. <laughs> Well, this is where I, you know, really want to acknowledge you because when we're in that situation and we don't have help, you know, it's even worse, right? Like we can get more depressed. We can't help ourselves. And then, you know, to have somebody feed you and take care of you and bring you water and all the stuff Uh that you need really allowed him to have the energy to do the writing. Uh So I really research. Yeah. And the research. So it's, it was like a team effort. (laughs) Absolutely. It was a team effort. And Brandon and Shannon were there too, Mm -hmm. which you might think was difficult to have a two little kids, especially Shannon was just a baby. Mm -hmm. But actually, it was very helpful to Bruce, because they learned that they could not get and jump up and down on the bed and stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) I was probably like swaddled in a blanket at that point, right? Well, I see. This was, it would have been around a year. Around a year? Close to a year. A year. Well, 69. I mean, I was born in 69. You were 69. Yeah. This happened in 70. Early 70 had to be, right? Yeah. So you were um, crawling around. Yeah. 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 You were ambulatory. <laughs> yeah. Enough, but enough you motion know, to cause a ruckus. <laughs> yeah. But it was, a, it was a delight to him to have you crawl up on the bed, have Brandon mm-hmm. sit next to him, you know, and we both, Bruce and I, read to you kids all the time. Mm-hmm. And so he could do that, mm-hmm. you know, participate mm-hmm. with you guys in that way. Mm -hmm. So it was a time of closeness. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it was a real time for him to slow down Mm. and go in. That's true. And reflect Mm -hmm. on where I am and where I want to go. And, of course, that was the problem because where he wanted to go, they were telling him that he could not. Right. And he would not. So, obviously, he did recover to an extent, Mm -hmm. where he did eventually do all his gong fu and all the stunts and everything that you see in the movies. Mm -hmm. He did all of that, but he was never free of back pain again Mm -hmm. in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. It was always a source of um, needing therapy, Mm -hmm. either from me or from (laughs) a professional. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of massage. After, when he was making his films in Hong Kong, I mean, it was so grueling, all those fight scenes and everything. I don't even know how he could do that, really. Mm -hmm. Because when he would come home every evening, he would be so sore and have to do a massage. And, you know, he did acupuncture. He did cupping. Mm -hmm. He did various things Mm -hmm. um you name it he did all kinds of therapy Mm -hmm. but um it was a constant thing Mm -hmm. in his life when he started sort of constructing his healing did he seek the advice of uh doctors well doctors certainly but also physical therapists oh sure he Mm -hmm. did he wanted information from every source he could find it Mm -hmm. So not just reading books, but yes, he would consult with physical therapists, massage therapists, Mm -hmm. Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. When we lived in Hong Kong, when he was making the films, he frequently had acupuncture or cupping or massage Mm -hmm. of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Chinese herbs and all that? Oh, sure. You know. You were brewing those stinky herbs? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. So, so, yeah, he had a lot of input. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then he he, um, would gather all this input and 
deduce it in his own way mm -hmm. to what he felt was applicable to him. And yeah. Well, I think that's really important, actually. You know, doctors are humans, just like, and, and they're, what they're offering you is their educated opinion, but it's still an opinion. Well, that's why they call it the practice of medicine. Yeah. <laughs> they're, still, they're still practicing <laughs> on you. <laughs> and I think a lot of times, you know, I know I do, and I'm sure he did too. I mean, he seemed to have a particular genius for synthesizing material. Very well put. But, and also a highly tuned intuition. Mm -hmm. But I know for myself too, like whenever I'm given sort of, you know, a bunch of information around something like, you know, I've had to assess thing, you know, medical information from a variety of sources. I'm always thinking like, well, this, does this feel, this doesn't feel, this part doesn't feel right. This part right. makes sense. This part doesn't make sense. I'm going to try this, see what happens. Da, da, da. But a lot of times people just... Doctor yeah. said this. That's yeah. That's they just, oh, I know the Bible. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, there you're a chip off the old block. <laughs> <laughs> Assessing information. Yes. Well, I mean, for real. I have a question. How long did he spend in that kind of down, depressed time after he was given that diagnosis? Yeah. And like, what was the thing that like made that turn for him to go? I'm really going to take this into my own hands and start doing something. He was in the down, literally, position, mm -hmm. uh, bed rest, for most of several months. Mm. But his change of mind mm. about how he was going to facilitate his own recovery started very early. Mm. You know, he's, I'm going to read this, I'm going to ask these experts, and I'm going to, but at right now i'm going to lay down and rest this because that seems like the best way of approaching this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because after all he had a physical injury so right. you have to rest it to to cause it to heal and, and the damage was to his fourth sacral nerve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i don't know what they would do about it today that would be kind of interesting but yeah, if any doctors want to want to write in and let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it depends on what the damage and, is. And, but... and, you know, had he not gone back and wanted to get to the point where he could do his kung fu, do his kicks, do all the stunts and everything, if he had not wanted to go in that direction, he may have improved even to a greater extent if he'd had a, like a normal life <laughs> yeah if it he wasn't was ready to go yeah <laughs> yeah if it wasn't continuing to sort of re-agitate yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and also making those action movies it's not like he yeah. was just walking around like a normal person he no. was doing no. but he was motivated he was driven mm. that he was going to do that mm -hmm. and so he did so when did he start to heal like he was down on his back and they said you're not going to walk normally you're not going to ever do those kicks or kung fu ever again and he obviously wasn't going to accept that <laughs> and, and he yeah. started this protocol yeah at what point did he start seeing that this was working or you well know? you know it was all so gradual mm. at first he could walk better at first he could ride his bike at first he could do kicks below the waist mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. it was, every step was very gradual mm -hmm. and um eventually i mean it was probably a process of at least six months before he felt like he could be almost normal so i say almost normal because he could do his things but afterwards he always had to have recovery time mm -hmm. for his back yeah, which I can imagine when you're filming, there's there's not there's no recovery, recovery time. time. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? I mean, right. especially when you're filming in Hong Kong. I mean, yeah. there's no there's no yeah. union where they're like, oh, you have to have this many hours of rest before you yeah. can come back to work. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like doing um, say a fight scene in Enter the Dragon. I mean, it might take three minutes on the film that you see, but it might take three days to film it. Mm -hmm. even more. Yeah. And so he would come home at night knowing he had to go back right next the next day and do it. So everything in our household was centered around let's fix Bruce's back after mm. his shoot. big day, mm -hmm. after the shoot, let's work on his back and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. So you were part of the like that pit crew that the, the, the car triage team. into yeah. the triage yeah. you're just like yeah. changing the wheels and massaging the back <laughs> yeah really i guess so yeah. 
<laughs> to make him revved yeah, up get to go. ready for the next day. Mm. But his desire was so strong mm. that he was going to just give it his all. So from the time of the injury to the time of relative normal ability, would you say was what, like almost a year or? Well, I would say maybe six to eight months or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd have to refer back, and maybe you can do that too, um, when he did another show at that time in the 70s. I mean, did he do um, Marlowe or, you know, we'd have to refer back to the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I'm not good with the dates. <laughs> me, me either at this point, 50 years later. <laughs> but he was, he was very anxious to get back to work. Yes, he was. And so to but, that. But you have to remember too that in 1970, he wasn't working. He didn't have a job to mm. go back to. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> but he wanted to continue to teach. In teaching, you don't have to be doing it all the time, mm -hmm. you know. And so that part was gradual as well. He could teach his private students and show them what to do without having to do it all the way mm -hmm. himself. And during this time when he was really laid out, didn't you have to get a job? <laughs> as a matter of fact, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that was a hard time in our lives financially. And before that time in the 60s, we had always rented a house. Mm -hmm. And then our friends convinced us that it's much smarter to buy a house. Mm -hmm. Then you can deduct your mortgage interest from your taxes. Mm -hmm. But in order to pay taxes, you have to make some money first. <laughs> <laughs> and right. this proved to be a problem because then Bruce wasn't working, bringing in a lot. And we had a house payment and two kids. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so I did get a job and I wasn't qualified for a whole lot of things because I hadn't finished college education or anything. But I did get a job and I worked nights at a switchboard. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Old-fashioned switchboard, plugging in the plugs oh, and taking wow. calls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Bruce was very embarrassed that I would have to go to work because mm. this was not his Chinese way of thinking. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be the mom staying home with the kids. And, mm -hmm. and so he did not want to tell people that I was working. Mm. So during the working hours, I think I worked from 3 to 12 midnight or uh, 4 to 12 something like that and um if a phone call came for me he would just make up a story oh she just went to the store <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he watched the kids while you were working he he did yes mm. so um you know he fed them dinner and put them to bed but they were pretty little at the time so yeah, and they did what daddy said <laughs> yeah <laughs> Baba, they they called him Baba yeah. when mm -hmm. they were little. That was his name, and they did what Baba said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then when I got home at night at midnight, he was usually in bed, and that was a depressing time for him. Mm -hmm. He he didn't want to admit really that we needed to have the money to, mm -hmm. and I didn't make a whole lot of money, but it helped. But then, mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess it wasn't too long after that that he got the offer to go to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So now we're into 71 or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just an added thing in case he's listening. <laughs> I I hung up on Trini Lopez three times when I was working the switchboard. Who, I don't know who that is. <gasps> oh, my God. You guys don't know who Trini Lopez no. is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think some of your listeners might know. <laughs> anyway, he was a um, big-time musician at the time. Uh -huh. um, what do you call Caribbean-type music, salsa. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, I kept unplugging the wrong plug. And oh, accidentally <laughs> hanging, hanging up, up on him. <laughs> he'd call back, and I'd go, oh, my gosh, Trini, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
probably don't want to put that in because <laughs> because who cares? <laughs> no, it's a fun fact. <laughs> well, and I, I don't even know how many switchboards there are these days. This was when people would call in and want to get hold of their doctor at night because their child was ill or they had an emergency. Mm. So it was, and then you'd have to call the doctor and connect them together and... Oh, it was like an answering service, oh, it like was a an live answering, answering service. service. It, it was. Okay, it was okay. a live answering service. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which it, it took a, a modicum of coordination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you have that job? Oh, gosh, it wasn't that long. Maybe six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you had income from the schools still at that time? or. Um, well, we didn't have the school at that time, but Bruce had some private students. But then for part of that time, he couldn't he do couldn't any teach. teaching. And yeah. that was the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a really hard time for you guys. He's it was. down. It was He's a really hard physical time. Physical injury. The money's not coming yeah. in. He's yeah. not getting work. Yeah. You have to go get a job. You have two little kids. Yeah. Yes, it was. That's it was intense. a very hard time. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So many people go through this kind of right. very hard time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they know that Bruce Lee could pull himself out of that, there's <laughs> hope. Well, <laughs> I feel like why this is such a relatable story is that so many of our fans, you know, will say, like, we'll talk about this kind of injury. Or, you mm -hmm. know, all of us kind of go through something like this something. at some point mm -hmm. where we're down for the count. Right. And then it kind of feels like, oh, when it rains, it pours, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just yeah. the back injury. It's the money. It's yeah. the you got little kids. Yeah. You got, you yeah. know? Yeah. So because he seems like such a superhero and he's on such a pedestal, it's important for people to hear that he was a person, he was a human, yeah. that he went through all these things and had to figure out his right. way. Well, I think that's part of his universal appeal, mm -hmm. that he appeals to people who are down and out and who have problems that are, seem insurmountable for whatever reason, their own fault or some other influence that has caused them an injury or getting fired or... Or even just some traumatic, traumatic event, event an accident, out of con their control. And people are going through those things every single day so they can relate to the story that mm -hmm. Bruce was going through. Now, they might not be able to go out and make a kung fu movie, but, <laughs> but just the idea that they can pull themselves up. Mm -hmm. Well, but the truth of the matter, I mean, that was his chosen profession right. and his love and his passion. Right. And just the notion that he pulled himself out enough and healed himself enough to go back to work. Right. And that he had the mindset of being creative and thinking, what can I do to solve this problem? You know, mm -hmm. instead of, as we talked before, about sinking into the negativity of it. Mm -hmm. So if this doesn't work, let me try this. Mm -hmm. And so always looking at options. Mm -hmm. And schooling himself about different options. And being uh, really like the ultimate self-experimenter, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. well, I let's always, try this. Let's do this. I always happens. say he's the most self-educated man that I've ever known in mm. my lifetime mm. in many fields. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would you say that it's just his nature was curiosity and openness to learn or like what was well yes curiosity creativity mm. imagination finding different avenues that was his nature mm. yes it's just like when he came over uh let's i'm just thinking of another example when he left hong kong when he was 18 and his parents put him on the boat to come over to san francisco and they gave him a hundred dollars, and he was in steerage, like third class in mm. the in the boat, right? And what did he end up by the time he got to San Francisco? He was up in first class te <laughs> teaching people dancing, you know? <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, that was a gift that he had. Mm -hmm. He knew how to dance. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, cha-cha champion of Hong Kong. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so he figured out he figured out how to get up to the top of the boat. Hustle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was training some dance lessons for first class passengers so yes. that he can be up there. Yes. Yeah, and that's how he got started in San Francisco too, that he uh, started by teaching dancing. Oh. And he was teaching Bob Lee and his wife and a group who 
was the brother of James Lee, uh, oh. the Kung Fu man mm. that he eventually became partners with. So it's always oh, the, so you the know, dancing led into the that. dancing led into that. So was he teaching dancing at a dancing school or just no. his own? No, just people he met. So how does one just? He's an immigrant, young immigrant. Yes. <laughs> and just randomly gets these dancing clients um, <sighs> and, and, and customers when this is like before the Internet, you know, before yeah. Yelp, before any. <laughs> like, so, I, yeah. You know, I, I guess I don't know the actual answer to that, <laughs> but he was very good at making connections. Mm. So first he has connections with some people on mm. the boat, mm. right, mm -hmm. who are getting off the boat in San Francisco and somebody knows somebody mm -hmm. and somebody wants to continue with their dance lessons or whatever it was. You know? Oh, I see. Yeah. So he mm. did a demonstration, really, on the boat. That and taught <laughs> dancing. And taught. Mm -hmm. and, and so then... Yeah. He had this yeah. captive audience of first-class yeah. passengers mm -hmm. on this boat. Yeah. And, it, and, of course, he was very personable. Mm -hmm. so yeah. He and that's the thing, people. right, that everybody always says is that mm -hmm. he was so charismatic oh, and charming. And, yes, he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by that, I mean, at that point, he probably didn't even speak English that well, right? He spoke English. He like did. at 18? Yes, he did. Mm. Not American English so well, but... He started learning English when he was 12 mm. in Hong Kong in school. But you know that story of when he first had his first English class and the teacher told everybody in class to write down their English name. And he did not know his name was Bruce. And so he looked on the next kid's paper and wrote that name. <laughs> so, I'm John. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean he didn't he didn't know his name was Bruce? Well nobody called him Bruce. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> But I have to say about this learning English that I don't know if this started in Hong Kong before he came to the States or I I know that he took it up assiduously when he got to the States is that he would buy books of English idioms. American mm. idioms mm. so that he would not sound like a fresh off the boat guy. Mm. And so he learned very quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes he would say some funny things and I would go, what? <laughs> 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 because some of those books were written funny. <laughs> <laughs> Old fashioned. <laughs> yeah. And he did, he always had a slight English accent. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know that? Yeah. I know. I used to stand in front of him and I'd say, okay, I want you to say sport. And I'd say, sport. And he'd say, spot. <laughs> said, Not spore. <laughs> yeah, because they teach the Queen's English yeah, in Hong Kong. Yeah, they teach the Queen's English, right. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I was fascinated when years later I looked through some of those English language books that he had and that he had underlined all mm. these idioms and stuff. And then he, um, he was so good in writing English that when we were in college together, and I had to take an English class. And I'll never forget the book that we read in my class was The Animal Farm. Mm. And I had to write an essay. And he wrote the essay for me. He did. <laughs> yes. And I got a, an A grade on it. Yeah. He helped you cheat in your English class? <laughs> Yeah, don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> Except but, the, yeah. the, the yeah. millions of people but listening. It, but the thing is that his his grammar was so good. Mm. It's better than most of, uh, of us native speaking right. English people mm -hmm. because he had to learn it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 However, you can see from his writings that when he had a train of thought in later years, when he had a train of thought, he would often make mistakes in grammar uh -huh. because he was just thinking in Chinese. Mm -hmm. But then if he wanted to produce a finished document, his English was perfect. Well, it's interesting that you say because much of the writings, most, I would say, are, are in English. So uh -huh. was it his preference to write in English? I mean... Uh, to write in English, yes, yeah. but think in Chinese. Mm. Mm. Hmm. So East yeah, well, West. Chinese, you know, I mean, his his Chinese writing was very good, mm -hmm. but it's harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what finally kind of tipped him over the edge where he just felt like he really was on his way and conquered? Was it just because he had to go do the next shoot? 
or was there a moment? With the back injury. Mm -hmm. You know, when he first got the offer from Hong Kong to come over there, and and he he just, by that point, he was doing well Mm -hmm. with regard to the injury. And he said, well, this is it. This is my opportunity. Mm. This is something I have to do. And so then he even started training even more to be ready for that. Also, I wanted to know, after this whole experience, did he seem different at all as a person, as an artist? Because he had just gone through this very traumatic and deep self-inquiry. Did you notice any kind of differences in, in him? You know, I can't say that I really did, except that he became even more intense about his film career, his film future, Mm. because he had always planned that he would not continue to do these heavy-duty action films forever. Mm -hmm. You know, that was how he was breaking into the business, you know, just like his script for The Silent Flute Mm -hmm. was not heavy-duty action. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the direction he was moving. So he became even more deep thinking about his future Mm -hmm. and what he wanted to do. And he had so many ideas and he was always jotting down things. So I don't think he really changed that much from the way he was before the injury, but maybe more of in a hurry. Mm, you know, so I want to do this now. Felt mm-hmm. a sense of urgency more. Uh-huh. Mm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he was really looking forward to, you know, he was starting to get more people interested in him on a worldwide basis. So he was starting to think of ways that he could continue to show the world the beauty of his Chinese culture in different ways. Mm. I think mm. also why this story and this moment is so meaningful is part of the reason we get to do this podcast is because he had that time to reflect and write. You know, we are talking about a lot of his philosophy that Mm -hmm. he helped that were crystallized and written in this moment. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so we're so grateful, even though that was such a hard time for him. Do you have um, anything that is, a thought, an essay, or a piece that he wrote during this time that really resonates with you personally and is like a favorite Mm. of yours? Oh, my goodness. You know, actually, the one I'm thinking of is maybe not right during that time when he was injured, Mm -hmm. but those writings he did when he was injured also were a teaching mechanism for himself, Mm -hmm. a growing mechanism. Because as you know, as you said, when you write down something, it becomes more ingrained Mm. and a way to connect, continue your own education. And so later on, he wrote many drafts that you have all seen about in my own process, Mm -hmm. you know, and how I am never a fully mature person, I am always maturing, and those kind of st- statements. And I, I think that was very relevant to the way he lived his life. Mm. So I think that was a very meaningful time mm-hmm. when he wrote those words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Sometimes I just think, uh oh, it was such a shame that he did injure his back, you know, but then what came out of it was all these notes that we have mm-hmm. that we've been able to learn about the way that he thought and felt and his philosophy, which has become the major important thing about his life, mm-hmm. that it teaches other people how to live mm-hmm. and has done so much good for other people. Mm-hmm. And sure, it, it gets a little... Um, it's sad that he could not continue on to develop this more, but then... He had one child left to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> he loved that song, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I think that's such a beautiful part of the story because so many of us can get really down in the dumps when something bad happens. Uh-huh. And to think of it as a bigger picture, um, if this didn't happen yeah. to Bruce, we wouldn't have all of yeah. these writings. Right. That's right. 
Yeah, there's so much we don't know, but then we can't know. Mm -hmm. So Well, and also, I mean, if this hadn't happened, he might not have pushed so, you know, his career forward at mm -hmm. such a pace also, which may have been a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, like, who knows what the path of his life would have been and would we have been left right. with so much. Right. But that's a good lesson for all of us mm -hmm. because we can all go back and say, well, if that thing hadn't happened to mm -hmm. me, I would not be the person in this place mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? We, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. never know which ones in our life are the <laughs> turning points. Well, I think it's also this whole story is such a great reminder that we, no matter what the circumstance, whether physical injury or not, mm -hmm. that we are all the creators of our own wellness and our own life. Yes. And that he took this moment to have to look so deeply at the issues that were causing him problems at the time, mm -hmm. I'll be them physical, you know, that if we ourselves stop and really work through in a really concerted and directed way, whatever problems we have in our lives, that we too can, you know, grow through them. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, the essential lesson mm -hmm. of how the back injury influenced his life. Mm -hmm. and the gift it gave to all of us. Mm -hmm. I think it expanded his consciousness and his uh, the vastness of his knowledge, mm -hmm. too. I mm -hmm. mean, because he read so many self-help books. I mean, not only did he learn so intimately about his own anatomy, <laughs> but, you know, and how to care for it, but yeah. he read all those self-help books during this time and, you know, and as we said, put down so many of his thoughts as well positive things yes mm -hmm. yeah I also want to say that him being an architect of his own healing mm -hmm. you know because we surrender that to other people so often yes mm -hmm. and not that you shouldn't listen to your doctors of course but that you don't have to do that exclusively that your own intuition your own mm -hmm. ability to construct your own healing mm. is another lesson that Bruce Lee I think teaches us. Yeah, it's a lesson in not giving up your power. Mm -hmm. Right. And trying different things mm -hmm. too. Yeah. If the doctors told him to stay in bed and that's it <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. he never would have progressed. So he tried other avenues. He added to that therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He also had support. He yes. also asked for support. Yes. And I think that's really important because he had you built in, but a lot of us then start to isolate. Let's say we're injured or we're uh -huh. down and we yeah. don't want to ask for help. Mm -hmm. That it's really important to raise your hand and say, I need some help right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And, that's and, very and true. all of us can't say, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I can, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> some of you can. Yeah. But, you know, let that be just a, a metaphor yeah. for we yeah. all need to say, Linda, to somebody. <laughs> to somebody. To That's somebody. Very true. Yeah. To, yeah. In very a moment true. where we need the help. Well, yeah. and also, all of us need to be that person mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. someone calls for help, mm -hmm. if we can, yeah. to do what we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for coming and uh, joining us and talking about thank dad, you. baba, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and getting into the nitty gritty of all the storytelling that I'm, I'm sure everybody's going to really love hearing uh, all the details. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank all you. right. Well, so that wraps up another episode of the Bruce Lee Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Mom, for joining us. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And if you guys want to reach out to us, you can email us at hello at brucelee.com. And we'll, we'll see you next time. Yep. See you next time. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. You can find show notes on brucelee.com and follow us at at Bruce Lee on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please subscribe to the Bruce Lee Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. You can email us or send us a short voice memo to hello at brucelee.com. Hey, everyone. This is Shannon Lee. If you are enjoying our podcast and would like to support us, you can do so by donating at brucelee.com slash podcast. This podcast is really a labor of love from my heart and Sharon's heart to all of you out there. And we would really appreciate any support you would be willing to give because it just helps keep the love flowing. So thanks so much. And again, you can donate at brucelee.com forward slash podcast. 
Mortimer.